Winning Cures Everything. Now for your hosts, Gary and Chris. Good morning, good morning. It is Sunday, September the 8th. I'm Gary. And I'm Chris. This is Winning Cures Everything. You can find us basically everywhere. We'll get to that. We'll get to the sponsors here in a little bit. This is the College Football Recap Show. Chris, I had a terrible week game. <laughs> yeah, I lost a lot of money yesterday also. Oh, um, you, you did not lose as much as me, my friend. Oh, well, my goodness. No, no. I, in our gambling picks, I didn't. <laughs> but in, in real life cash, I would venture to say it didn't go as well. Um, yeah. Let let me tell you something. Yesterday was a lot of fun, though. I, I, I oh, lost yes. money, and I didn't. I, I can't figure these teams out. But man, this Look, is it, football, it, and I'm really glad we got this because next week's slate of games, it it might be time to spend some time with the family. It's uh, it's kind of eh. Next week, obviously, we'll do our previews on Tuesday night. Uh, but yeah, I I was looking through them last night. And there's really nothing that kind of stands there are, out. There are two games that I actually care about watching. And Iowa State, know. Iowa, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Iowa State, Iowa, and then the UCF, Stanford. And literally, that's the list. And I think I'm probably going to try to get some points with the family. I, I can understand that. Uh, Stanford, UCF, Arizona State, Michigan State is next week. Yeah, that doesn't move the needle for me at all. Washington State at Houston is on Friday night. Uh, yeah, no, no, that's that I will watch. No, North, that I'm all in on. North all Carolina in. and, uh, and, I'm, and Wake I love Forest. that that's a Friday night game. I love that that's a Friday night game. Yeah. Anyway, so, right. North Let's, Carolina Wake Forest is that that could end up being fun because that's two two and O teams with some interesting offensive pieces and. True. You know, we'll get into North Carolina here in just a minute. What I wanted to bring up, and I should have brought this to the forefront beforehand, you know, we were talking about how we can't really figure out this season for whatever reason. So I have gone through on a spreadsheet and taken the week one picks and week two picks from several of the other sports personalities Correct. that are out there. So Bud Elliott, who is from the Banner Society, from Podcast Ain't Play Nobody, yep. he is... 12 and 19 so far right. in his gambling picks. We're in, we're in good company with him. Yep. Uh, Stanford Steve is sitting at 4 and 4. Oh, I know the other guy. Uh, Chris Felica is oh 1, 7, and 1. He got Oregon I, State to pull through for him last night. I, I know. Yeah. Uh, Clay Travis actually doing really well, sitting at 16 and 12, but he had an awful week. The, the guy that usually is the worst on this list. Yeah. Uh, is killing everybody. Chip Patterson from the Cover 3 podcast. Yep. Six wins, 11 losses, one push. All right, so we're we're in good company. Uh, Tom Fornelli from the Cover 3. You see Sook decided to come in and join us this morning. Yeah, you got the dinosaur so with you. Believe that. Tom Fornelli is nine wins, 11 losses. And finally, Barton Simmons from uh, 24-7 Sports, et cetera. Uh, Ten wins, eight losses, one push. So hey. – I don't feel so bad. Like it, the first couple of weeks have not gone well, but we're gonna get this thing turned around. I'm feeling good about it. You ready to hop in? Let's roll. Let's recap last night. Topic number one: <laughs> LSU 45, Texas 38, and the note that I put out beside it is Joe Burrow for Heisman. I actually think he's in the conversation. He oh, deserves that kind of respect. I don't think he's going to win it. I don't know that we can do this all year round. I say we because I am a part of this team. I emotionally <laughs> live and die with this. Um, that's my quarterback. I'm a T.O. it here. That's my quarterback, man. And uh, I, I, I think he deserves to be in the conversation. And if he continues on this path, I mean, he had almost 500 yards last night. And yeah. that was – so I, I kind of poo-pooed what he did against Georgia State because you know how I feel about big teams playing little teams. I think they can name their number for the most part, and they chose to name a big number. Um, <clears throat> other teams played little teams, chose to name small numbers, and, and that's the way I believe. But Texas big team, that's a real defense. That's a real football team, and they're really good. And at no point in time did I feel like the game was out of control. I know at one point in time it was three, you know, three point game down at the end of the game close, 
but I never felt worried. I never felt afraid. I felt like we could score on almost every possession. They did. I think yeah. they three times, two times. I mean, it, it wasn't a lot of punts. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> it, was, son, it was fantastic. I, I don't know that I've I've seen a game where we threw for more yards than we ran for. We threw for almost five times, four times more yards than we ran for. Well, I do remember when Nick Saban was there, they they destroyed Alabama in I think it was two thousand three and Rohan Davy had like Yeah. Just ridiculous stats. Was, I mean was that was Josh Booty the, the receiver at that time? Josh uh, Reed. Josh Reed. Yeah. Yeah. He had like two hundred and eighty one yards receiving, like yeah, it, it was it was bonkers. All right, so from 2000 to 2018, LSU played 246 games. Zero of them had 30 completions and four touchdown passes. It's all that stat today. There are two games in which it has happened in the last two weeks. So right. they are changing things up in 2019. Coach Orgeron, uh, you saw that last drive where they're up by six and – Normal LSU no, situation. No running the football. No killing the what? clock. We are putting it on the throat. Third and seventeen, right? Yeah. I mean, and and just decide. You know what? Keep rolling with it. I mean, he averaged twenty something yards a pass last night, almost. Yes. Um, and, and these aren't like little swing passes that the guy runs a long way for. Now we had a couple of those, but I'm talking twenty yards in the air, and he was throwing dimes. I mean, he was throwing seeds, man. Yeah. He I really just was. I was shocked by his accuracy. Not that I didn't think he was an accurate quarterback, but he was threading holes. Now, I will tell you the there was a throw into the inter, into the uh, end zone one time where he tried to thread the needle through three guys that got batted down, almost got intercepted. And I was like, I think he's getting a little cocky. I think he's <laughs> I think he's feeling himself just a little bit because that's a throw that like Peyton Manning makes, that Tom Brady makes, that drew like the most accurate quarterbacks of all time make. That is not a throw that that most college kids even try. No, but he agreed. was feeling himself. Oh, he and he should have been at thirty-one out of thirty-nine, four hundred seventy-one yards, four touchdowns, one pick. Uh, had three receivers go over a hundred yards, which yes, is sir. crazy. Uh, Justin so Jefferson, by the way, absolute oh, yeah. beast. He had no, nine no. catches for uh, one hundred sixty-three yards, three touchdowns. I mean, just so. I, I want to give a little credit to Texas. I know I crap on them all the time, and I pick fun at them, and I, and, and I butt heads with them a lot. That's a real team. Sam Ellinger is a stud, yeah. and, and I said that when we did the preview of that game and, and everything. I thought Joe could go toe-for-toe toe with him. He's the guy that's already had a little Heisman trof, uh, hopeful talk before the season started. People compare him to Tebow, and, yeah. and, and Joe just never got any of those comparisons. I thought they were – I'm not going to say the same guy, but I didn't think Joe was beneath him. This was the first time that I thought we're going to go head to head with the big boy quarterback, and my guy's just as good as the guy on the other side. And it's been decades of being an LSU fan, and I haven't, I don't remember thinking that or feeling that for a while. Um, LSU's defense is really, really good. Texas offense, really good. They are young. And they are not deep. They don't have the depth that they used to have. And man, at the middle of the third quarter to the fourth quarter, I knew LSU had to score every drive because there was no question Texas was going to score every drive. Our off, our, our defense just didn't have the dudes anymore. Um, and and I, and I just thought all all that I know and I liked was don't give up the big plays. Make them go on long drives. As long as we score every drive, then 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 just the clock will eat out. They'll run out of time, and that's exactly what happened. Yeah, the, the clock faded away. They ran out of time. That I'm onside you, my kick stopped, was my heart stopped at the onside yeah. kick because I felt like if they got that, they they get it, and and thankfully it would have just tied unless they go for two and take us into overtime. But our defense wasn't making a stop. I just that's the first time in a long time I felt man. Like you're we got to shoot out every drive. Yeah. Because yeah, our offense, our defense is not making a big stop here. They were just gassed, and I don't know—is that a conditioning thing, or is that just a sit, uh, situation where they're we're just not that deep like we usually are, and and the guys are playing way more snaps than they used to. I haven't dug that deep into it, but um, man, it, look, one, it was a lot of snaps, but it was also like. It was a hundred degrees at kickoff. It, it was insanely hot. You know? it, and while everybody can I mean, say Baton Rouge, Baton yeah. Rouge ain't no ain't no winter park, okay? 
Yeah, everybody can say that you're used to it, but it, it's still that's still rough conditions for just about anybody. Like they, they need to build a hill in Baton Rouge, and they need to run that every day. Just run it every day. Give them today off to recoup, and Monday I need to see somebody running stairs, hills, bleachers, something. I oh, believe that. Believe that. All right. So before we get into topic number two, which, by the way, this is the starting 11 that we'll do every Sunday for the college football recap before NFL kicks off, of course. Um, but this is the starting 11. You can find us over at winningcureseverything.com. You can uh, find the show on YouTube, on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, whatever your favorite podcast app is. Uh, go subscribe to it. Make sure you leave some comments. Share the show out. If you're on Apple Podcasts, leave a nice review hit that subscribe button for us. Again, share it with your friends. Tell everybody you know about it. We appreciate the support. We want everybody coming in and hanging out with us whenever we do these shows. Um, the show is brought to you by Tunica, Mississippi, the South's premier sports gambling destination. You can find more information on all six of their incredible sports books over at tunicatravel.com. They are awesome. I, got, I went down, spent a lot of time there last weekend, I uh, have not gone down this weekend, but I will be next weekend. So we'll we'll see how this uh, how this rolls. But they've got some really good stuff going on. You can find more info on it at tunicatravel.com. Our Pick'em Contest is sponsored by them. Uh, if you want to jump in for next week, this week's is already closed. But next week, it'll open up on Monday night-ish, sometime around there, Tuesday morning maybe. Um, but go check it out. Go check it out. Topic number two. Chris. Michigan 24, Army 21, double overtime. I The question that I have in this is, what is happening with Michigan's offense? And they, I don't know the answer to that. There's three different things, right? It's like, all right, Gaddis wants to do this, uh, this tempo thing. And the running game is having issues, and the offensive line can't block. And Shea Patterson doesn't look as comfortable as he did last season. Right, So at the beginning of last season, in the Notre Dame game, obviously he was uncomfortable in that, but over time, within a couple of games, he started to really feel himself in this offense. Then they bring in Josh Gaddis. They want to push tempo. They want to try some different things. And they just... I, I could almost write away the Middle Tennessee game. But with this one... It just continues to – I mean, Rice had success against Army. And were it not for Army throwing an interception in the end zone uh, early in the second half, I mean, this is a 21-7 to game, and Michigan has no shot of coming back. Yeah, I, I don't know what's wrong. Um, I mean, I do think this Army team's a lot tougher than I thought they were. Um, so, so I want to give them a, a little credit. I almost think that Army was was looking ahead past Rice last week, like because probably. they if they probably. won this game, it's likely they go twelve and zero this year. That's right. Oh yeah, I know. I don't see anybody else on the schedule, man. I mean, it's it's gonna set up well for them. Um, <clears throat> I can't figure it out. I don't know. They've got talent. They've got athletes. They better figure it out quick because um, not next week. The week after, coming up soon. They've got. Don't they play Wisconsin in the next couple of weeks? They, yeah, so they have a bye week this week, and Wisconsin does as well, uh, yeah. and that's that's going to be another topic. Oh, yeah, their right next here. their next big game. Yeah, their next well, their next game period. Well, the is, next game, yes, but yeah, but it's it's, it's in two weeks. It's not next week. Yeah, I knew I knew it wasn't next week because I looked at the slate of games for next week. And <laughs> there wasn't nothing interesting but, there. Would have been um, nice no, to have that, that one this listen, week. They, right? they play like they played the first two games. Wisconsin's going. Listen, Wisconsin has hung like 140 points in two weeks. Well, that's okay? a, 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 hold on to that before we get to okay. it. I, it's way down on this list, but we're going right. to talk about Wisconsin. Right. Let's talk but, about but, Michigan but right now. A, but no, I just don't. The offense better figure something out. Yeah. Because I know Michigan's defense is good, but at some point in time, these big boys in the in the Big Ten, they're going to score. They're going to find a way to score. Now, you're right about that. At Michigan, 2.4. You, you're not as good as we thought you were. Yeah, Michigan, 2.4 yards per rush right now. They only had 108 yards on 45 attempts. Shea Patterson, 19 of 29, 207 yards. Not great. Army, they missed a 50-yard field goal as time expired and then fumbled at the Michigan 35 or 36, whatever it was, in the second overtime. Uh, both teams had three turnovers. It was – I'll tell you this, it was riveting. It was insanely yeah. entertaining to watch. 
I wonder, I wonder if at some point in time during these two weeks of practice that they're going to have to get ready for Wisconsin, if during practice, if Shea's not more comfortable, if the offense doesn't look better under McCaffrey and they just make a move. I mean, it's – I doubt that that happens. But I don't know, I, man. Because this is – I think is, Harbaugh is sick of this. I think Harbaugh wants to win, and 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 you can you can blame it on him because he's the head coach and he takes ultimate responsibility. But at some point in time, he can't go out there and play quarterback four. He has to eventually agreed. find a quarterback to run his system. And, and I don't think that you know, this we is – We can say Harbaugh is overrated. We can say all these things because of his record. But name a quarterback that you would want – to run and lead your team that's been his quarterback since he's been at Michigan. Because I, I can't. There's not one. There's not one. But, I mean, they've they've been LSU for the last – since he's been there. Just like they got dudes and they're they're okay rate, but they just don't perform on, on Saturdays. And, and you're right. And I don't know what you do. And at some point in time, if you – you know how I feel. If you know he ain't the guy – Let's bounce him now. Let's just let's just move and on. And I don't I don't think that's. I'm wondering if it's a Josh Gaddis thing. Uh, that that offense has worked before. That guy that guy knows. I think he knows what he's doing. I think in going up tempo. Look, I was worried about it as an LSU fan. Um, it's definitely affecting our defense because well, yeah, but it, look, now. Think but, about it this way. Think about it this way. Gaddis has never called an offense like he's never called plays before. Yeah. Like, it's like Loxley talked about. Like, you look at the difference between Michigan's offense and Maryland's offense, right? Which we'll get into that here in a second. But uh, Gaddis has never called plays, and he's got to find a way to make Patterson comfortable. I think that that is the, that's the ultimate end goal is you find a way to make our quarterback feel good about what he's doing. That's, and, and no, we're not changing quarterbacks, but we will change the offense if we need to. I would normally agree with you on that. Man, I don't know that Patterson's ever going to be comfortable doing anything. I mean, he just might not right. have what it takes to be a a, a big-time starting QB. I, I did find it a little strange that this is supposed to be that tempo offense and everything. They ran it 45 times, and they threw it 29. Yeah. Well, 30-whatever it was. They had, Never, a, another, yeah. they had a couple more times there. But either way, let's move into topic three. Uh, Maryland 63, Syracuse 20. We could not have been more wrong about this game. Uh, yes, there sir. is no college game day for Syracuse next week against Clemson. That game looks like an absolute dud now. And Maryland's talent is for real, man. Uh, Maryland, 11 out of 15 on third down against really what was like a top 30 defense. Like Syracuse is no slouch on defense. Uh, 650 yards of offense. They scored touchdowns on seven of their first eight drives. Uh, Syracuse offense, they've got major problems. I don't know what – like, they still put up a lot that's of yards. Two a, that's two weeks in a row they haven't put up a lot of points, though. So. Yeah. I mean, just uh, the ACC right now looks really, really weak. Uh, yes. But moving back to Maryland, like, let's let's talk the positive on this side. Maryland has had 28 non-half ending drives this season. 19 of them have resulted in touchdowns. That is – an absurd efficiency rate. Like, that's it. nobody else in the country is close to this. Uh, is it possible Maryland could give some of these bigger teams fits in the Big Ten, you think? Yeah, I, I do, because they can score. Okay, we, we watched, I mean, I watched a little bit of Penn State Buffalo. Penn State struggled to score, okay? Early. We've, now, they, they were able to do it late, but yeah. Yeah, but that's what happens when the big boys, you know, the, the little guys you. get tired and they don't have the depth. But, but, at some point in time, you play an offense like this, I think they're going to score all day on everybody. Yeah. Michigan hasn't been able to score. They better be worried. Michigan State hasn't been able to score. They better be worried. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree. All right, let's move in. Topic number four, second-year coaches in trouble. All right, and I got some, I got some stats here for you, okay? All right. uh, here are the four coaches that I'm pointing out. Maybe I'm missing somebody. You let me know, but – BYU 29, Tennessee 26 in double overtime. Tennessee is now 0-2 on the season. San Diego State 23, UCLA 14, Chip Kelly 0-2 on the season. Ole Miss 31, Arkansas 17, and it really wasn't that close. No. Nope. Chad Morris is 1-1 one one on the season, uh, but 
they only beat Portland State by a touchdown last week, and they were favored by over 40. Uh, mm-hmm. Florida State, 45, Louisiana Monroe, 44, in overtime. And the only reason they won that game, remember, Florida State was up 21 to nothing in the first half, and ULM came back and had this game in overtime, and they missed an extra point in overtime. They would have sent it to a second overtime. I'm going to list these in the order of panic, in the order of most likely to be fired this season or at the end of the season. Okay. The first one, I'm going to list Jeremy Pruitt. I would agree with that. That would be my number one. His, His buyout is nearly $10 million if they fire him by February 1st, 2020. Now, it it's a little more if they were to fire him this week, I mean yeah. it'd be in the, you know, 11 million dollar range. But I I'm, I'm going to go on record here. You know these buyouts are are just that that in these big boy SEC schools. Oh, it's not just that. It's it's just a college football across the board, power 5 yes. conferences. Power power, it power is well, absurd. some schools don't have that kind of money, but literally that somebody could set ten million dollars on fire tomorrow. Yeah. Tennessee could raise ten million dollars before we're doing this at nine thirty before noon today. Yeah, and so, and they, so they, they will do the, it. <laughs> yeah, I don't care about the buyout. Um, keep keep going with your list, and then we'll get into these guys. And I'll tell you what I think. You tell me what you think. So. Number two panic list: Willie Taggart. Okay. Now his buyout is seventeen million, but they did not look improved really at all from week one this team like they've got Virginia next week I don't think that's going to go well like yeah. I they, I have I have a I have a, a a philosophy on on Florida State and their troubles and we'll get into that maybe um if we have time how about this let's let's finish the list and then I'll let you give this me your list. theory yeah uh okay. third I'll give you my list Number three, I've got Chad Morris, and oh, so Willie Taggart's buyout is seventeen million, yeah. um, which is a lot of money. A lot of money. Mm-hmm. Chad Morris, number three, his buyout is twelve point two five million if he is fired before uh, December thirty first, I think, of this season. So, yeah. yeah, the Waltons could could write a check tomorrow and, and yeah. not even know that that money came out of their four billion dollars. I think that they understand where they are and what they were moving away from, and that okay. maybe makes it a little bit easier. We'll disagree with that. But, you know, number four, I've got Chip Kelly. Yeah. And I, I think that UCLA is setting up for like a 10-year rebuild. They don't care what happens right now. They were tired of Mora. They were tired of everything that was going on. They want the entire football program, the whole organization – redone from top to bottom and it's going to take three Time. four five six years completely and they, agree on that they just don't care chip, right now i think chip kelly has the longest leash out of all these guys and i don't know that it matters um it's going to take time when you move into a system like he's trying to run and build you it, you have to strip it down and it's going to take a little bit if you don't already have somewhat of the talent there. When he took over Oregon, remember, he was the OC at Oregon for several years. They had already had his guys there because he was the one recruiting them and running that offense. This is going to take a little bit of time. I think he's got the most leash. My philosophy is Pruitt, then Chad, then Willie, and 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 then Chip. So let's get into Pruitt. We'll start with him. Okay. Okay. Um, I was wrong on this because I thought he was going to be a really good coach too. He he might just not be a good coach. And this is the reason why I think this. And this is not just Tennessee's a dumpster fire and they've got problems with another. He I, I always say this, and I didn't follow this rule when they were interviewing him or he was interviewing for jobs and, and people were trying to get him, thought he was going to do good. I never really want the genius on the same side as a genius. I don't know that I would ever hire <laughs> Alabama's defensive coordinator, because Nick is a defensive guy. I now, it, it worked you, out well with Kirby oh, Smart, but yeah. yeah, it did. You're you're right. It absolutely did. And I'm not saying that everybody on that side of the ball will never be good. I think the odds of them being great well, yeah, are if slim. You just and look through what's already like Will Muschamp, 
Yes. And whoever else, right? They, yeah. Like I mean, Mel Tucker a, seems to be doing okay, but you know, yeah. he was he was not a defensive coordinator. He was defensive backs coach at Alabama, and then he went and became defensive coordinator for Kirby. Yes. But we'll see but, what Kirby is I think, without Mel Tucker. I think a Tucker. lot of that has to do with with Kirby and 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 whatever. But we'll see. Yeah. But I I mean, there is a philosophy here that Pruitt's just not a good head coach. I will tell you, and we talked about this a little bit on the preview of last week. Is I mean, he seems to want to kind of seem to want to be like Nick which is really hard to work with and really difficult and really like stern in his ways, man, you got to earn your right to be that guy though. You don't get to walk in the door and say, I've never been a head coach before, but I'm going to be an asshole from day one and you're going to do it my <laughs> way or no way. And like that just, people don't respond to that. Nick walks into a room. He can do that because he's a God. Yeah. He, Jerry Pruitt, not a God. A, a, a newsflash. He might not realize that, but he ain't. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and it's just one of those things that shocks me that these guys – I know that to be at that level of success, you've got to have that kind of ego. I don't have that kind of ego, so I don't know how to relate to that or even think like that. But it, I think he's a guys-to-go situation. I know that they can't keep firing coaches every two, three years, but, but why the hell not? If you know the guy's not the guy because they've got talent – and they don't have talent to compete with Alabama and Clemson and Florida and Georgia and LSU, but they got talent to beat BYU and, yeah. and, and Georgia State. Like they, you know, they they've got talent. I thought and, that they had. I'll tell you this: I don't think that uh, uh, Garantano is. I don't think he's going to be able to win there. Like he made some really really bad decisions, and I think that. Jim Chaney, the offensive coordinator, is doing the best that he can with him. But I, I am I was shocked at some of the play calling. And man, did you see the I, end of the game? Like the when they the were 60, up sixty nine yard whatever yes. to get them in field goal range to tie and take like, an OT. How in the world do you give that up? Like I And just, Jeremy, you're the you're the DC, man. You're the you're the head coach and uh, you're a defensive guy. You can't allow that to happen. Here's the thing, it, it all trickles down from the head down. It, and that's just the way it's gotta be. All of these coaches, I, I said it with Harbaugh, you know, he can't go play quarterback for him, but he's still responsible. At the end of the day, yeah, you're still the guy that's gotta wear this. And and Pruitt hasn't been good. He's been out coached by lesser quality programs all the time they they got the talent to hang with these guys it's him that's getting out coached him that's getting out prepared and outworked and if you know that i don't have any qualms with firing that guy and not giving him a long leash and i would explain that to my next head coach when they say man every two years you're firing a coach why would i come work for you just make it crystal clear dude these guys came in and they made promises that they couldn't commit if yeah, you they make didn't know what they were doing. If you if you overpromise and oversell yourself, then 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 we're gonna do the same to you. If you're straight up with me and you tell me how you're gonna do this and you're playing for, for for growing this program and you're the guy we choose, then great, we can get along. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to beat Nick year one, and we've got to get away from trying to find the next Nick. There's not gonna ever be another Nick. Yeah. Okay, and and hiring the guy that that coaches under him ain't gonna work either. It doesn't work in the NFL. All these guys are going out trying to find the next McVay. They tried to find the next Belichick for 20 years. It ain't working. That's, that's a, Just find the best guy you can find. Yeah. All I'll that agree. to say this. The next step, I think it's Chad Morris. And 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 I think Arkansas is a long – I thought he was a bad hire from day one. Didn't, didn't think that that was going to be a good fit or good merits. I knew it was going to be really hard to, to rebuild because the styles that they were switching from – but they're not getting better. They're, they're not executing better. They're not they're not improving at any level of the game that I've seen over the last two years. Yeah, last um, night was was rough to watch. At the end of the season last year, they didn't look any better than they looked at the beginning of the season. And I know you can't change the style of play, but at some point in time, you've got to show improvement. They're just not doing it. I think he they try I think they tried to be cheap when hiring him. I think I, they went and got a let, lesser coach. I think you're right about that, but let me. But partly because I think, well, no, I mean they're paying him quite a bit, and they paid him a lot Chavis of money. But they, all that they but, didn't do a big coaching search, and and they didn't. Well, go they get they it. wanted Gus Malzahn, like that's yes, what they wanted. You're right. You're um, right. And this, this was this, the the second choice. But it, right. I, I got to tell you, all off season, 
I heard how much better this offense was going to be because they got right. their guys in there. They got their quarterback. They got Ben Hicks. They got uh, Nick Starkle. They got, you know, all these guys. And they were feeling good about the offense. They're going to be super improved. And, da, da, da. and I swear to you, right after week one, it comes out like, well, they don't really have their quarterback. They don't really yeah. like either of these, these guys. Excuses, and I don't like oh. that crap, man. Yeah, it was so irritating. Let me let me get to Willie for a minute, all right? Okay. I don't know if this was something that you and I were on a group text or talking to somebody at the same time, or if this was a different conversation that I had. I cannot remember for the life of me if, who told me this, but I swear before everything I know it's right, good, and holy. This is this is true, and this person could have lied to me, but this is this is a conversation that I heard about Florida State and what's going on there. So there was a time where I was all out on Jimbo, all right? Yeah. All out because of the Jameis Winston thing. I think Jameis raped that girl. I think he did, and I thought Jam- uh, Jimbo helped cover it up, okay? And the and the conversation that I remember hearing being told to me, and, and, and I remember it like it happened yesterday, was very clear. Jimbo went into um, – they, they told this, this was a writer, so some news reporter or something, and he said, be ready for a press conference tomorrow at such and such time. Uh, Jimbo's going to do a press conference, and he's going to uh, kick Jameis off the team. Yeah. Right before that happened, he's the press is all there, the conference is ready to go, and like four or five of the most powerful boosters in Florida State came in and told Jimbo point blank, you're not kicking this guy off the team. You, you figure out a way to make it work. You're not kicking him off yeah. the team. After that happened, and Jim won a national championship. Well, no, he, he had won the national championship before that's a, that. He, yeah. Well, that's, yeah. and that was the argument. They said, you're not, you're not getting rid of a national championship quarterback, okay? After that happened, the response was Jim knew he was not going to stay at Florida State long because he wouldn't work for people that did that, and – I think he systematically began to destroy the program. And he, he wanted to make sure I'm whoever takes this over, that I have salt as this land. You are not growing anything here. And and when I leave, there will be nothing left. I don't like that what y'all made me do. And it was kind of one of those things where you're gonna play dirty, I'm playing dirty. And on my way out, it's gonna be bad. I've seen Willie Taggart win. I've seen him do it. I know he can. I think it's going to take a while, and Florida State either needs to be patient or just know they're going to be Tennessee. They're going to. You want to fire a guy every two, three years? Fine, do it. But you're not going to get better doing that. At some point in time, you got to let him work the ground and figure this thing out. You may be right. It made right. me respect Jimbo a lot more because I was pretty out of him on that, and, and that was a personal decision of mine. Um, I wish I could give credit to the person that told me this or, or, or whatever. I don't even remember where I was. I had told I you some of that, but it, it, we had heard it from different people. So okay, it's, yeah, we yeah. both heard. We, we've I thought, discussed. It I thought before. you were involved in the conversation before. Yeah. You, you and I have. We've talked about that before. So, but anyway, so that tells me Willie. If those people are smart and they they saw how bad it got before Jimbo left. I, I think, and that wasn't the only reason why Jimbo left. It, there was it, he oh, wanted no, more money I, for uh, facilities. He wanted no, that's right. You know, but he I, I, think, I think after the Jameis thing, I think he just started picking fights and was ready to leave. I, and he, but, he I wanted, but he wanted to get paid on his way out, so he did that. The, he pulled an Antonio Brown, but there aren't loopholes in his contract. Now we we're talking about Jimbo Fisher. Let's go ahead and move into that game number five on the list: Clemson twenty four, Texas A and M ten. Uh, Jimbo 100% scored on that last drive to get the cover against Dabo. I completely believe that 100%, uh, which worked out well for you. <laughs> Watching those lines, Jimmy. Watching those lines. Uh, oh, boy. Man, I got to – this felt so unexciting, like anticlimactic, right? I didn't, I didn't like the play calling by Jimbo and, and the offense at all. Which they is, the weren't game trying felt to stretch secondary. Like, they weren't. Yeah, they weren't trying to stretch the field at all. Every every pass was a screen pass behind the line of scrimmage, two yards out. Whatever you can do that when cornerbacks don't make good open field tackles. These Clemson cornerbacks are young, and you can beat them in coverage 
but you're not going to just hope that they miss tackles. They're too well coached for that crap. Yeah. I mean, it was it was just – now, the impressive thing that A&M did, they completely held down Travis Etienne, right? Yes, um, that, I mean, you he, said it. You talked about the defensive coordinator, and you talked about that young defense. Listen, they got after Clemson. Yeah, 16 carries, 53 yards, 3.3 yards per carry. Uh, Trevor Lawrence, 29, or sorry, 24 out of 35, 268 yards, one touchdown, one pick. Uh, I mean, they, they did a good job against that Clemson offense. Yes. But the there offense was just didn't come through. There was too much talent yeah. for Clemson and Clemson themselves had Kellen Mond just completely shook early in that That's game right. yeah Kel- Kellen Mond if he's gonna if he's if a is gonna be the team I thought they could be before the season starts he's gonna have to be better than what he was yesterday because yeah. because I I think the receivers were getting open against these cornerbacks <clears throat> he wasn't making throws and they just quit trying I mean, I think they tried a couple. I'm not talking about 40 yard bombs. Just just run a couple of 12, 13 yard outs. Yeah. And they weren't doing any of that, man. That offense, I felt like they were incredibly predictable from the couch. If I know that, I assure you, Brett Vittable knows that. Yes. I mean, that's one of the best defensive coordinators in the world. And and so, yeah. Let's uh let's talk about another great defensive coordinator that's now turned into a head coach. We'll use that to transition, right? Yep. Number six on the list, Colorado 34, Nebraska 31. In overtime, Colorado uh, quarterback Steven Montez is severely underappreciated, and Nebraska is who we thought they were. So, I, I mean, this Mel Tucker's Buffalo schedule looks way more manageable now That's than it did. Juicy. Yeah. I mean, it's a, we. What did I have them do? three and nine? I think. Yeah, we didn't. We didn't give them a lot of credit this year, and we were wrong on that. There's a couple of guys that yeah. we're going to talk about that we were wrong about. Next game, we're oh yeah, one. we were we were way wrong. Uh, Nebraska was up seventeen to nothing at the half on this. Uh, Nebraska did shut down my boy Lavisca Chenault. He only had uh, what was it like six catches for sixty something yards, whatever it was. But this game K- didn't go the way I thought it was at all. This was so much low scoring than I thought. K. D. Nixon. Man, with six receptions, 148 yards, and one touchdown. One of those, did you see, what was it, the fourth quarter? I forget yes. exactly what point in this ball game it was. Was that the one to tie the game? The No, I, I think it was It was like 17-7. to seven. And no, then, man, that wasn't it. And then they, or maybe, no, maybe it was 17-10 to 10 at that point. Either way, the flea flicker in the end zone. No, like, this wasn't the one I was talking about. Who runs a flea flicker from your own end zone. It was from like the four yard line. They hand it off, you know, pass it back to Montez, and then he flings that thing, and it's like a 96 yard touchdown. It oh, was man. insane. I mean, you, you talk about some gigantic huevos. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good game by Colorado. And oh, yeah. You, you said exactly right. Nebraska is who we thought they were. Yeah. They they most certainly are. Adrian Martinez looked good, you know, whatever. Sixteen out of twenty six, two hundred ninety yards, two touchdowns, interception. Had nineteen runs for sixty six yards and two touchdowns. So four TDs that, on the day. That quarterback by far rating wasn't the best defense he's going to play all year. Though. Oh no no no, so, no. not yeah, not by a long yeah, shot. Go, but go, go ahead and get those stats now because when you get a Big Ten play, oh yeah, I, Iowa's not going to be as easy. Nebraska's not going to be as easy. No, Wisconsin, for sure. Wisconsin, that was who I wanted. Yeah, Ooh, sorry. Ooh, man. Uh, and we'll move down to them here in just a second. But number seven on the list, North Carolina 28, Miami 25, Mac Brown. Mac Brown is 2-0 and this season against former Texas defensive coordinators who are now head coaches. And now their schedule sets up. They are at Wake Forest. They've got App State coming to – uh, Chapel Hill, and then they host Clemson at the end of September, and we could see College Game Day coming to Chapel Hill. There's just no way. There's just no way. I'm just so wrong. Like, okay, so last week I admitted I was wrong on Mac Brown. This week, I, it's like I owe him an apology now. Like, like not just wrong, but way, way wrong. We we could not figure out this staff. We couldn't figure out. Anything about what they were doing up there? I, this and makes me question everything I thought I knew about football. 
Did, did you watch the end of this drive or end of this game when when I, North Carolina I, I won the game? I watched a little bit of the fourth quarter, but I don't know at what point that I come. I kind of was coming in and out between a couple other games. All right, so with about two and a half, maybe three minutes left in the game, their freshman quarterback Sam Howell gets mm-hmm. sacked twice because that's what Miami does. They they're good at getting sacks, right? Sam Howell converts a fourth and 17 on a 20-yard pass to the Miami 40. They drive down, run a little more clock, et cetera, et cetera, which this kid, by the way, just balls of steel. Like he is yes. ice water in his veins, whatever yes. kind of cliche crap you can say, that's what he's got. Uh, he threw the 10-yard game-winning touchdown with one minute and one second left. And then Miami's Bubba backs and misses a 49-yard field goal as time expired that would have tied the ball game. Like, it's just – this is storybook crap is what this is. Yep. And and they can keep it going. Now, it, this game with North Carolina and Wake Forest next week that, – that You're right. That is, is going to be a fun game. That's interesting. I was looking at the slate. Yeah. It, it's going to be fun to watch. Yeah. I, I agree. Two 2-0 two and o teams. And, man, I'm telling you, like college game day – in Chapel Hill, I think we need to get Felica on the show this week. I need to I need to see what the rest of the lineup looks like before I'm saying go to see watch Clemson. Oh, I was I was looking through it. We'll we'll talk about it on Tuesday night. But I'm I looked through it. I think it's entirely possible so long as North Carolina ends up four zero, right? But yes, uh, either they way, have to. We'll move on. Number eight, USC forty five, Stanford twenty. We'll try and roll through these fairly quickly. Uh, USC, I mean, they were down. 20 to 10 and they rolled off 35 straight points unanswered stanford could not do anything with them well, USC might be just fine with the pac-12 being the way they are i think, I mean, there's I think nobody that scares anybody uh slovis is the freshman quarterback he was 28 out of 33 for 377 yards and three touchdowns yep. clay helton safe for now they play at BYU next week. That is a physical team. They'll have to be able to do more than just kind of fling it around a little bit uh, because the Stanford was not physical in this game. Like, no, just, man, this was not the Stanford team that played. No, it, it, that's that's the note that I had out here was what is going on with Stanford? Like I, it, I don't, I don't know. I I don't understand what David Shaw is trying to accomplish. There's no identity on this team. There's. I just I, and I understand that their quarterback was out. I get that, but but so was USC's, and yeah. you knew your quarterback was out, and he played half the game last week, <sighs> and and so and you had an entire week of practice to get him ready. I mean, both teams had quarterbacks out. Both te- now I think Stanford also also has uh, their left tackle out. That's like an NFL prospect or whatever. So yeah. I mean, I guess that hurts. You're Stanford. You don't have that many level offensive linemen, but. I don't know. USC just overmatched them completely. Well, that that they, offensive lineman them. being out was was not the problem. No, I mean, they gave up forty five points on defense. Like <laughs> that's right. That's it. You're, that's it. You're right. So. Yeah, it was just just sad. Uh, topic number nine: Ohio State forty two, Cincinnati zero. Either Cincy is not as good as we thought they were, or Ohio State is just elite. Like they are freaking unreal and. I think it might be somewhere in the middle. I think there's a little truth in both of those. I think Ohio State is far better than I thought they were going to be this year. Yeah. And as soon as Cincinnati's starting quarterback went down, there was no hopes for them at all. The offense completely stopped. They were doing fine. They still had zero points, but they were moving the football and 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 seemed to be able to like get some things going. When he falls out of bounds, running out of bounds, you see him hold his shoulder, hold his arm, his elbow area, and you just know they that guy's up. done for the day, and you just hope that it's something minor. If he doesn't come back, I don't know that Cincinnati is one of those schools that's got just you know a train of quarterbacks that next man up, and we're going to be just fine. Um, so that that could just really derail what I thought was going to be a special year and, and a good season for them. Yeah, I, I do agree. Justin Fields. Ohio State looks looks elite. He just looks incredible. Yeah, he's 20 out of 25, 224 yards, two touchdowns, nine runs for 42 yards, 42 yards, two touchdowns. Since he had two turnovers, Ohio State outgained him 508 yards to 273. It was just a, a beatdown. It was just – it wasn't ever so, close. 
I watching this Saturday, I thought of one storyline we're not going to get because Clemson's not going to play anybody ranked the rest of the year, probably. Yeah. And and so we won't get this storyline. But if I could draw up a perfect playoff and my LSU Tigers not be a part of it at all, it would be Alabama against Oklahoma and Ohio State against Georgia. Oh, yeah. To play for the national championship. I want to see these guys that transferred play their old teams so badly because both those guys are looking crazy stout. Oh, yeah. oh, it, And it's early, and we'll see what they yes, look like later. You're, but, you're exactly but, right. It is early, but it's been fun. Oh, it's it, speaking of fun, that'll transition into the next one because I know that you have loved this every second of it. Topic number 10, Wisconsin 61, Central Michigan 0. Look, quarterback Jack Cohn is efficient. The offensive line is dominant. The defense is back to being unreal. Like, this is a legit team. They gave up 58 yards of offense, and that's it. 43 passing, 15 rushing yards on, on 21 attempts as far as rushes go. They only allowed 157 yards to uh, South Florida. Jack Cohn is 45 out of 59 on the year for 565 yards, five touchdowns, no picks. They are the Number one most efficient team on offense, defense, and special teams in the country. Yes. I mean, it is it is unbelievable. Did you see the tweet that I sent out earlier? Like, if you uh, – from, from, like, ESPN's FPI, which they take all these success rates and everything else That's into right. uh, account. Um, between every team in the country, they are the number one team. Let's see. Here's here's the list on it. Um, da, 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 da. Number one in overall efficiency, Wisconsin with ninety eight point seven out of a hundred. Number two is your LSU Tigers ninety six. I knew we'd be in the top five. Oh yeah. Number three, Ohio State at ninety five point six. Number four, Air Force at ninety four point six. Number five, Clemson ninety four point five. Maryland ninety four point four. Number seven, Alabama. And 94.2, then check this out. Another team we might have been wrong about. Number eight, Kansas State Wildcats, 93.4. Now, it helps when you're playing, you know, Bowling Green and, and whoever else. But uh, number nine is Georgia at 92.0. Number 10, Michigan State at 89.8. So that that is your top 10 in overall efficiency. And Wisconsin just running away with the thing. They're about I as perfect. I can't, I can't wait until that Michigan game. Oh, I can't wait. I mean, it's just if you look at their schedule, they maybe nobody can score on them until like November. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know how I feel about this team. You, you know, I yeah. mean, that's just that is a place that when I was a young man growing up watching football, learning about college football, and I played offensive line. And I had an uncle that taught me the game. He always taught me, you being a big boy, you watch Wisconsin. That is a place that the offensive linemen get laid more than the quarterback. That is a place (laughs) that those guys are king on campus and nobody knows the quarterback's name. And that's the way it's been for 20 years. And, And they are back to that. It's been a couple of years since they've been that. It looks like right now, now they play kind of a soft schedule. We really don't know what South Florida is. But well, we might know what South Florida is. But anyway, that yeah, I that didn't could put all South come Florida crack. in the notes. I, I might yeah. should have but because no, Charlie no, Strong. No, we shouldn't have. But like that, there's no. There, we'll see who they are in two weeks when they play Michigan. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, finally, last topic, topic number eleven, Pac-12 after dark. Now I'm gonna start it off with with two non-Pac-12 teams. Okay, uh, but I stayed up. Super late watching these ball games, and yeah, I shouldn't have because I'm I'm struggling this morning. Yeah, but uh, but man, look, starting off with Fresno State and Minnesota, like those are two teams, really well coached teams. Like people yep. can talk all the trash about PJ Fleck they want to, and, and I'm not a huge fan of him, but he's got those boys ready to go, and and they are willing to go to bat for him, and that's that's pretty awesome to see. Uh, but they get the win, thirty-eight to thirty-five in overtime, 
And, I mean, it hits right on the number. Like, they were favored by three. They win by three. And if you didn't watch it, it was on CBS Sports Network. They, Fresno State had a touchdown pass just waiting. Yeah, I mean, it was wide open, and he floated the ball. He just left it in the air a little too much, didn't put any zip on it, and the safety for Minnesota got under it. Minnesota now 2-0, and uh, but that was in overtime. It was epic. It was crazy. Minnesota had to score with, like, 10 seconds left in the game just to get it to just overtime. To, yeah, just to get the OT. Yeah. That this morning. It, it, was, it was pretty insane. So that was the non-Pac-12 after dark. That was just, you know, it packed. Coast after dark. <laughs> now we move into Pac-12 after dark. The Fresno, or not Fresno, sorry, Oregon State and Hawaii game only being on Facebook was the most epic thing to watch on gambling Twitter I have ever seen in my life. People are trying to figure out where to watch this thing, and they only have Twitter accounts. They don't know where to get at the game. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. And that all game, these people that left Facebook after the election and all this stuff now now trying to find college football. Yeah, exactly. And on top <laughs> of that, all of these people that were counting their money when it was a twenty eight to twenty one halftime score, which is forty nine points, and they're thinking there ain't no way we're not hitting this over seventy eight. That's right. And turn the TV off, go to bed. Exactly. And instead, they get up and find out that there were only ten points scored in the second half, and Oregon State didn't score any of them. I mean. Look, I had the under in that game because I thought something crazy could happen, right. and it most certainly did. I and was then just about finally, to say, something crazy happened. <laughs> uh, here is the craziest thing that happened of the night: Washington, number fourteen in the country, goes down twenty to nineteen at home to the Cal Golden Bears, who honestly, like, I'm in trouble with my my under five and a half now. Right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> I mean, I'm in serious trouble, but the Pac-12 is in even more trouble because Washington was the next best chance for a playoff team aside from, what, Utah? I mean, there was Oregon, Washington, and Utah. I'm going to tell you this. I think if we get chaos throughout the rest of college football outside of the ACC, if Oregon goes undefeated outside of their one loss to Auburn and Auburn ends up being a 10-win team, yeah, then and I, even, if, even a nine-win team – I think there's a chance that Oregon could get in. The So the washington Cal game really did not get started until – what time did I tell you? It was like 12 Massive, massive delay in this game. And yeah. I, I think it, was, it, was it was a two-hour and 41-minute lightning delay. Yeah, that's right. That actually knocked out the power to the stadium. Did you see that? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I was. I, I saw all this stuff this morning. I, I was not staying up till 3 in the morning watching this. <laughs> no, sir. No, I'm going to bed. But look, I like Cal before the season started. I told you that. I oh, liked yeah. him a lot. I thought this was going to be maybe the best defense in the Pac-12. I think defense travels. I think defense wins. And um, and and man, that that was no joke. And they found a running back. Now they don't have yeah. a great quote unquote offense, but if you can't stop that cat, it doesn't matter. I mean, they well they they got they got multiple of them, right? They they, they got Brown Jr. They got Darcy. Or Dancy, sorry, and then uh, and then Garbers, the quarterback, can actually run a little bit himself. It, between those three guys, those are the only three guys that actually ran the ball for Cal. They had 192 yards. They averaged 5.1 yards per rush, and both of their touchdowns came on the ground. Like yep. Washington was not able to man up and beat them. Well, well, here's the deal, and you and I have said this. For as long as we've watched football, we believe this. Now, the game has changed so much. I don't know if it's still true today, but run the ball, stop the run. Believe that. Cal, Cal can do that. They're not going to win the Pac-12. They're not going to, to, to go undefeated or run the table or whatever, but they are going to beat some guys that are better teams than them because they're going to stop the run. You're not running the football on them. And – you're you're going to be hard pressed to stop them running it. I'm yeah. real anxious to watch them play Ole Miss. Yeah, me too. Because it, it, Ole Miss looked a little bit better against Arkansas, but how much of that was Arkansas? How much? So it, that that could be a very interesting game. Uh, extra points. This will wrap us up. Everything will be done after this. Coastal Carolina twelve, Kansas seven, Kansas two turnovers. Coastal zero turnovers. Coastal's first win against a Power Five opponent. And they were one 
for nine on third down. I mean, it's just it, it, Les Miles' team will be somebody you got to fade basically all year, right? Like they're not going to be favored again, I don't believe. But man, that was that was epic stuff. And then last game, UCF forty eight, FAU fourteen. Now everybody is going to load up on Central Florida over Stanford next week. Like I think they'll come out, they'll probably be favored when, when the oh. Lions come out on Sunday afternoon. I think they're going to be favored, and they should be. The reason that USC was able to beat Stanford was because they – now, remember, Northwestern couldn't run the ball on Stanford, and they're not able to throw as efficiently, right? Yeah. USC's offense, what Graham Harrell does, ate up Stanford's defense. But what UCF has been doing, Brandon Wimbush is out injured. He might be back by next week. We'll see. But even then, he's not a great passing quarterback, right? He, but he was in a quarterback fight the entire offseason to win the starting job. So and yeah, Dylan. Gabriel, I don't know that their backup situation is going to be too too much worse than him. Dylan. Well, Dylan Gabriel was the the backup. He's the freshman quarterback. Yeah, that's right. He was seven of nineteen for two hundred forty five yards, two touchdowns, four runs for nineteen yards, and one touchdown. UCF though. The way that they were able to demolish FAU in this game, they had 312 yards of rushing, and they just ate up clock. They destroyed Florida Atlantic on the line of scrimmage. We'll see if they can do that against Stanford, but they, they're not able to pass as efficiently against a Stanford defense. So we'll we'll see what the line looks like. We'll see you know how everything goes, but I... I think I might kind of like David Shaw in this spot, even though, you know, and I didn't touch him with this USC line because it just smelled fishy, like something was weird about this. But we'll, we'll see what happens when the line comes out. So you ready to get some uh, you ready to get some NFL stuff going? Yeah, man. All right, buddy. We're going to get out of here for now. We will be back with the NFL recap tomorrow. This has been Winning Cures Everything. Check us out, winningcureseverything.com. Check out tunicatravel.com. We will see you guys again tomorrow. Thanks for checking out Winning Cures Everything. If you want to keep up with us, hit subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. Visit the website at winningcureseverything.com or you can like us on Facebook or follow us at Winning Cures, at Gary WCE, or at Chris B. Giannini on Twitter. Share out the show, leave a nice review, and make sure to comment and tweet at us.